This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can tell your stories, talk about your concerns. I'm the Child Welfare and Family Court System. I'm Dennis Lawrence, and today we have a very special guest with us. But before I announce her, I want to cut away for our months. Michigan for Parental Rights, Wall of Shame. A Florida couple 47-year-old Daniel W. Spurgeon and his 52-year-old wife Janice is charged with 700 counts of child abuse, sexual abuse, and other crimes against 11 children they adopted or fostered while living in Alabama. Daniel Spurgeon faces 388 charges, including child abuse, sexual abuse, and enticing a child for immoral purposes. Johnny Spurgeon faces 312 counts, including first-degree sexual abuse, human trafficking and endangering a child's welfare. Both are jailed in Fort Myers, Florida. The warrants issued in this case are as follows. Daniel W. Spurgeon Two counts sexual abuse of a child under 12. 115 counts sexual abuse first. 122 counts child abuse. Four counts sodomy first. Four counts sexual torture. Three counts domestic violence by strangulation and slash or suffocation. Six counts rape first. 115 counts enticing a child for immoral purposes. 6 counts incest. 11 counts human trafficking first. Johnny's R. Spurgeon. 100 counts child abuse. 1 count domestic violence by strangulation and slash or suffocation. 11 counts human trafficking first. 100 counts endangering the welfare of a child. 100 counts enticing a child for immoral purposes. As noted in the charges, this case involves a total of 11 victims who were either in the care of or the adoptive children of the Spurgeons at the time the abuse occurred. Daniel and Johnny Spurgeon, you're on the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. Okay, that special guest that I was talking about, um, all the way from Parts Unknown, she's back in Kent County, uh, Deanna Kulstra. And today we thought we'd uh, do a little discussion on uh, something that probably isn't discussed a whole lot, and that's the uh, your local community county meetings that most counties have every month and we're going we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what Kent County community does in their meetings the Kent, Kent County Commission some of the decisions they make and um you, you want to start that off Deanna yeah well I you know I've done a lot of things Maria Maria's helped me you've done some things too um, you know, just to kind of give a recap of some of that stuff we've done, we've done marches, we've done protests, we've written to, I writ, at one point in time, uh, emailed every House of Representative and Senate in Michigan. Um, I actually was the first person to file an impeachment request 
since I believe it was 1963 when it was enacted. Um, filed uh, complaints with the Michigan Bar. We've, I mean, we've been to Washington. We've been to all the Washington people that are there. And I kind of stepped back and I looked because nothing's changed. And a lot of people are still doing the same things. They're still doing all that. It's been done. I really yeah, wish people would quit. Petition drives too. They don't seem to go anywhere. Exactly. And nothing's changing. Well, I kind of took a step back and looked. And what I realized is, is it's our county commissioners. Now, when you go downtown and you go to the 17th Circuit Court, that is Kent County Courthouse. So what happens is the federal government, um, they send funding to Lansing, and Lansing disperses funding to all the counties, and all the counties disperses funding to all the cities. So our county commissioners oversee our judges. They pay our judges, and they are also the executive, judicial, and legislative branch for Kent County. And what we did go to actually to our county commissioners at one point in time, and they said there's nothing really that they can do, that they can't really help us. But I'm learning that they can actually help us. And I think we're going to have to put a little pressure on them. Basically, by cutting the funding, I remember um, seeing them um, giving money to um, some of the um, adoption and foster care agencies. Yep. I also remember uh, Judge Gardner was down there for a few meetings. Uh, to get uh, her family court ideas implemented and funding for that. So, uh, yes, it's very important that we um, attend those meetings. Uh, and, of course, you can bring up anything at those meetings. Uh, you know, they uh, allow time for speakers, right? Yeah. Correct? So you can go in. Um, I'm not sure how long it is, but you can go in and you can talk. They actually record it. And you have to go on Kent County's website and you can see the recordings. And I believe you can also copy a link and put it on your Facebook page if you wanted to do something like that. Um, now, another thing that I've learned, speaking of Judge Gardner, is um, I went back and I read about the uh, Ryan versus Ryan's case, the Tim Ryan's case. And so what happened was Kent County felt that they were losing, so they went into a private session. And they settled it, and he got a amount of money, and he also had to keep quiet that he was in this meeting. And so what's happening is if you have wrongdoing at um, Kent County Courthouse or Department of Human Service, it's Kent County Department of Human Services. Let's not forget that. It's all run under the county. And what happens if they feel that they're losing, they will take you into a private meeting and they will do a settlement and they'll make sure that you don't talk about it. So that's why you don't hear that, oh, we, people have gone to the county commissioners and they've gotten relief or they've gotten this happen because they make sure it's all hush-hush. Yep, and um, they, they funnel all the money, actually, I uh, to, you know, everything that goes on with the county so mm -hmm. I think that's a very good place to start if you can cut off the funding that's what you need to do well and I'm not sure if it's just cut off the funding it's also going there and putting pressure on them I don't feel that our county commissioner should be walking around in public and feeling safe I think we should be putting pressure on them I think if they're out in the public I think we should be asking what are you doing about family court what are you doing about DHS they're not honest they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing right and so you know if you see them in public you should be talking to them and asking them you know and get to the point where they don't want to go out in public because they don't want to be questioned and they don't want to be asked and if you're going to do a demonstration um, you know do it right there in your county and we've got people who are going to Lansing who's going to Washington to do these marches and you don't have to do all that you can do it right there in your county you can get the people who um, you know who are having issues in that county they can go right to their uh, county commissioners at their meetings they can demonstrate outside you don't have to try and get money in the hotel room to go to Washington right there well we we had some good times protesting too in the past uh, locally in the county here where we've gotten quite a few people out a few times yeah uh, some of our gov abuse protests were pretty good size and um, we had the camera down there doing interviews and, and you'll be surprised at the people that are out there walking that really support you now my favorite is if you are in Lansing and you want to demonstrate at the state capitol. When you stand in front of the state capitol with your megaphone, what's really great is it's a three-way road. So the people who are coming towards you 
have to stop. And so when you're on your megaphone, they kind of have to listen to what you're saying. So I really like demonstrating in front of uh, Lansing. Yep, in another form of demonstration, I mean, if you, let's say you only got two or three people. Mm -hmm. And we pulled this off a few years ago. We um, went to a, one of those uh, pat me on the back adoption special programs that they have to uh, uh, keep people be to keep people in the system to try to adopt these children and we went to the special the program that they put on and the awards they they were given out for the foster and adoption parents of the year in the Kent County and all that so what we did we um, diddled off some things about the funding and um, about foster care and we wrapped them up made them and you know, tied a little ribbon around them and we stood on the street as people pulled their cars in and we handed them some of our brochures and that continued for quite a while until the director of the agency Bethany Christian Services kind of uh, got wind of it and then he came out and but um, we had a good time and we actually were able to get some of this information to the people that might have been thinking about foster care or may be in foster care and never heard the other side of the story so um, well yeah. For the last year, I've been working for a behavioral health facility, and uh, we're probably going to be doing a show about that here soon as well, and my experience with that. So that's a pretty interesting subject um, about that. So we'll save that for later. But um, I'm finding that a lot of people on my Facebook page are discouraged. They're not getting anywhere. Um, nothing is happening. Nothing's changing. I mean, you have to remember, I've been in this system for 18 years. And I don't know how long you've been in dealing with it. Uh, eight years. Eight years. So I've been in it for 18 years, and we've I've done a lot of stuff. Take, take it back. It's ten years now. Ten years, yeah. And I've done a lot of stuff. I, you know, one of the things I realized right right off the bat was a lot of people were reinventing the wheel, and I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So I was trying to do things that nobody else was doing. I have legally stalked my judge. I've joined her church. I've showed up at meetings she's been to. Um, anywhere, any place I could think of. Um, she sits on boards. I've showed up at the board meetings. And, um, you know, when I joined your church, I got the email um, addresses to people in our congregation, and I sent them an email address. Uh, part of it was to protect me, because um, who knows what this crazy judge was going to well, do and put me in jail. Who knows? Well, see, if everybody does this, you know, I mean, you have a whole group that does this. I mean, that puts a lot of pressure on these judges. It does. And um, agency personnel. So. But I don't think people realize the funding's coming from Kent County. Our Kent County commissioners are the or, head of it. Or actually, any, any county is coming from. Yeah. Because but we're, we're the one that yeah. delves out the money. Yeah. So, you know, people need to go to their county commissioners. They're the ones that's getting the funding. They're the ones that's running the court. And I don't know if they need a special person who's in the court and dealing with the court issues, but... I mean, something needs to be done and nothing is being done. And there are so many people that have gone through this and there's so many people who are talking about it and there's so many people who's trying to make a difference and trying to make a change and change just is not happening. In 18 years, I have not seen a whole lot of change. And so, yeah. Well, you're right. There hasn't been a lot of change and change has come very slowed. I think they're doing a little bit more listening now, but I, I think it's because I think a lot of it has to do in our situation with the, uh, you know, uh, I got into this because of relative placement and uh, CPS, but I'm seeing less people that are foster care. It's like they have maxed out their foster care mm -hmm. business. So a lot of family members are getting children now where well, eight years ago was not the case in, in my area anyway, as um, I've been dealing with CPS in um, the Kent County and the Ottawa 
area, I've noticed that there seems to be more family placement because they just cannot find foster care people. Well, they're removing these kids and they've got kids sleeping in CPS offices. They've got them two weeks in the emergency room is some of the things that I've been hearing. Um, you know, and they're saying that these children don't have a safe environment to go to, so they're taking them, but they don't have a safe place to put them. And, um, you know, some of the things that are going, in, going on in these behavioral health facilities um, is just amazing. Um, I can't believe what I've experienced, and we'll talk about that for another show, yeah. but the whole foster care system, I mean, I don't even understand what they're even trying to do because it's not working, it's failing and kids are coming out of there with more anger issues than when they went in. And you know, you mentioned that, you know, sleeping on the floors in, in CPS offices. Um, I just got word the other day, uh, there's a foster care person that is, has cleaned his garage out because this is where the foster care girl's going to be staying and the agency is allowing that. <laughs> so. Okay, it sounds um, like a little yeah. um, dishonest, but all right. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, years ago, uh, if if I was going to say my girls were going to sleep in the garage, boy, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's happening. Uh, you know, I've I've been doing a lot of under undertaking, um, mm -hmm. checking things out. I know families I keep an eye on and these things are happening. <laughs> I just had a mom um, who uh, was in the system they took her child 18 years ago I want to say it was probably about 18 years and uh, someone had called on the child's father it wasn't even her current child's father it wasn't even to do with her and they said that they didn't substantiate any abuse and three months later come knocking back on her door and she's talking to them and I told her when you talk to them and you answer their questions you are contracting with them and I told her to stop talking to them and to start going through email because you can't tell your attorney what you said but an attorney can read your emails and finally she just continued on and continued on and I said look you've done everything she's asked you need to tell her to charge you with something or to go away and leave you alone you know right. and then when they um, Say the case is closed, get paperwork. Get paperwork, photocopy that thing 20 times and frame it and put it on your living room door so if they come to you, again, pull it and say, nope, it's closed, we're done. Unless you've got a warrant, don't bother coming to my house. Well, any, anything else you want to add about this or? No, nope, I'm excited to talk about my experience in the last year. So yeah. we'll do that another show here sometime oh, okay we can do that yes we can so well thanks for coming back you know I hope hopefully you stay you know well thanks for having me I'm not sure if I'm gonna stay I am tossing around maybe running for Kent County Commissioner maybe running for governor maybe leaving we'll see only time can tell <laughs> okay well thank you thanks for having me Dennis okay we'll be back after uh, this message if you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com.
we have the uh, producer Dennis Lawrence Silent Voices channel, but uh, we also have what we call the NPR Snippet channel. And I like to take a moment here and go back in time and look at one of our snippets. Well, hi, my name is Cherie, and this is my daughter, Lisette. And we've been in the system since October 2nd, when the day they took my two grandkids away from me. Um, on this side is my grandson, Crescencio. We call him Melon. And on the other side is baby Jordan, and we call her Sissy. This little boy right here, when he left our home, he was the best little angel in the world. We didn't have too much time with Jordan yet. He's so loving. He's in the home Head Start, and he, he loves his sister so much. He took his sister to school for show and tell. Three months ago, we went to court in front of um, a referee. And at the time, the foster parents said, oh, they're doing so good. And, and recently, we just went back to court. And all of a sudden, the foster parent stands up and has these horrible stories about my grandson. And it was such an angel. And I'm not saying this just because he's my grandson. He's been brought up with love and respect. All of a sudden, now he breaks windows, supposedly. He's harming his sister and the dogs. and the, They can't control him. First of all, he sh they shouldn't be foster parents if they can't control a four-year-old. What if they would have been placed with a baby that we had a drug addiction or was really abused at home and had autism or some kind of mental retardation? In that situation, a grown man stands up and says this about my grandson. My hands are shaking right now because there's no way and what it is is that these people want to adopt. And all in the, from the beginning, there's been reunification. My daughter has gone above and beyond everything on her own. I stand by her side. I got put on a re central registry list because they didn't want the kids to come with me. They told me pretty much, don't fight for your kids. I got a lawyer. I got my name removed. They still said I couldn't have my grandkids. My home was okay. It was all approved. They went through every little step. They waited till the last day before we went to court and told me that I cannot have my grandkids until my daughter is okay. And all this stems from postpartum depression. My daughter asked for help while she was pregnant. She asked for help for four or five, four months after she was pregnant. Sparrow Hospital even sent over to Sparrow Professional Building to her doctor's office saying this is an emergency and, my, and that my daughter needs to be seen and given medic medication for postpartum depression. They canceled once again out of six times. So my kids, my grandkids are in a foster home. My daughter gets to see them. It was three times a week, one day, one hour a day. Now it's went up to five hours because she can't have a home yet because she doesn't bring enough food, as they say, to feed them. But like I said, my grandson, Crescencio, over here, he is going through the worst thing ever. Jordan was only four months, so she doesn't know. They have my grandkids calling them mom and dad. Crescencio is co so confused. Um, he can't, there, there's no way you're ever going to break that bond between us and our grandson and my daughter. He has that bond and that's what's wrong with her. Her name is Amy. The foster father is named John. And to me, I think it's all about money. There's nothing wrong with my home. There's nothing wrong with my daughter's home. My daughter's been through hell and back, and I'm sorry to use that word. And she's still going through it. And she's not going to stop fighting for her kids. They can take as long as they want, but my grandson knows me there. Then just recently, the foster mom took his toy away. Like, really? You can take a toy away from a little four-year-old just to hurt his feelings more? She, I feel like when, when there's reunification involved in the surf, uh, situation, kids should not be placed in a home with the foster parents that are expecting to adopt a kid. Right. They can't have their own kids. Exactly. And you don't sit up and, if you're a foster parent, you treat somebody with respect and dignity. Yeah. You don't treat my grandson and hurt him okay. to make him act out in the wrong way that he shouldn't be acting because he's never had that problem at home. I don't even have to discipline. I don't, I don't have to yell at him. He knows what's wrong and right. He's a very loving child. And like I said, this is all about adoption and money and what they can get out of them. And she's not going to take my grandkids away. But here's my daughter. You can't. Well, she can't talk. She's sad. <laughs> but I, we lost our grandma, my mom, in July. My daughter had her baby in May. And that's the only blue-eyed little baby we have and our whole family. The rest of us are dark hair, brown eyes. She looks just like my mom. So that's our little baby Juju there. And my daughter, like I said, she's, and I'm not just saying this because it's my daughter, but she made some of the best kids ever. And we're gonna stand up and fight for them forever. 
no matter what we have to do. So like I said, there needs to be more help with these parents being able to get their kids back home when there's reunification. Never once have they re reached out to my daughter and asked if she need help with counseling. They don't ask if she needs help with anything. They don't ask if she needs help and do anything. All they do is try to put her down in every little situation there is. This, like I said, I, I, really you're complaining about what she brings for lunch. And then when she'll bring lunch, the mother already, the foster mother will already have fed them. And she can't even ask them questions like, why are you acting now? Why are you doing this? Because it's, it's just like, you can't even talk to your kids. You can't say anything. But all I'm saying is that there are fam families out here that do deserve to have their kids taken away and it needs to be investigated, but investigate and do your job. Don't just take them away just because you assume something bad is going on. And that's our, in our situation, they never even checked on other family members that we asked them to. They just took them away. So it's been going on since eight, October 2nd. What is today? So we're, I don't know, we go back to court September 19th and we're hoping for them to come home. But like I said, the foster parents stood up in court and said, my little Crescencio over here is not welcome in his home anymore. Do you guys think that that should be a foster parent? I think they need to look in the background of these foster parents that they're giving. We also had a family member that's been a friend of the family for 17 years, went through all the whole foster system, became a foster parent, and they would not let her adopt these kids, or let the, her foster my grandkids, but she can adopt, foster other kids in the system <coughs> through Lutheran Children's Services, but she can't foster ours, and it makes no sense. Everything that we do that they tell us to do, when it's, when it's done and over with, they come with something else new. So we're getting closer, hopefully, and they will be back home with us. And I just want to say that I'm so proud of you, Lisey, for everything that you've done. And you over there, Miss Lady, I want to tell you I'm proud of you for standing up for up here. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Bye. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice can make the difference.